What's your name? How old are you? Where are you from? What's your plan? What's your name? Where are you from? What's your plan? I'm telling you, that song right there has got so much, so many truths and so many doctrines to think about. Think about the name Emmanuel, God with us. To think about on his mother's side, he's born as a man. 
But on his father, and he's 12 years old, but on his father's side, he's always been. You know, when the Pharisees were questioning Jesus, Jesus was talking to them and they said, How do you know Abraham? How could you have seen Abraham? Because you're not even 50 years old. And Jesus' answer back was, I've seen Abraham. I am. He said, I am the name of God. Before Abraham was, I am. And you know what the Pharisees did? They picked up stones to stone him. Because when he said that, they knew that Jesus was saying, I am, I am God. Because that's the name of God he's always been. He was crucified as a man, but rose as the perfect Savior. God the man, perfect to pay our sin debt. And I praise God for that. I praise that we have a Savior that's perfect, that did all the work for us at Calvary. Proved that His work was sufficient. And all we have to do is put our faith in Him. I was walking around in between the services and on this um, uh, stairwell right here is where my oldest daughter asked Jesus in her heart. I'm sorry I did this last service too. I'm sorry, but just during VBS. And she sat down with me after the service and prayed and asked Jesus to save her. And I thank God that He saves. Jesus saves. And He is available for everybody that will hear and trust in Him in faith. Take your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 10, we're going to read a verse that's had an impact in my life. And while you're turning, I, want to, <clears throat> I just want to make one comment. Brother Josh had mentioned he had a puppy and that he needed coffee. Wait till you have kids. <laughs> Some people will say a puppy's training for a baby. <laughs> Not even close. Not even close. I just wanted to say that, buddy. <laughs> My wife and I, now, we're, we're, we, I, know, I know several of you. And we come to y'all's VBS. I've known Pastor Phil for years. We met in 2006 in Ambassador Baptist College. And since, uh, even since I've met Phil, my wife and I have had four children. Our oldest is Daniela. She's the one I was talking about that, that trusted Jesus here during VBS. And she's nine. And then we have David, who's seven, Sophia, who's five, and Isabella, who's three. And they're not with us this morning. We kind of had a a, a mishap on our schedules. She would, be, she would have been here with the kids, but she needed to teach Sunday school for one of her friends over at our church, Temple Baptist, over on Patton Avenue in Asheville. So she took the kids with her, and so she's there this morning. But we're glad to be with you and glad to be here. John chapter 10, verse 10. We'll pray and get started. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you, Lord, for this people. And I thank you, God, for your Savior. Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us. And I pray, God, as we look into your word, that you would move among us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would convict, encourage, challenge, whatever the need may be. Each person here, each unique individual that you know, that you made in your image, I pray, God, that would have a need met this morning from from your word and from your spirit. And God, we know that the Bible is your truth. And we thank you for it, that it's the rock, it's the promises we can stand on. And God, I pray this morning that you would fill me with your spirit, just to preach in, in the manner that pleases you, and that the words would be what you need for us to hear, God, that it would be you that speaks to us this morning. And we give you the glory for that, we give you the praise, in Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 10, verse 10. And Jesus said this, he said, the thief... Cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, to put this in context, I believe that Jesus, as he's talking about the thief, he's specifically referencing the Pharisees at that time and how they were oppressing and stealing, really, the joy and the livelihood of the Jews that through their laws and and, and through the man-made laws that they had. But I think that we can draw some principles out of what Jesus is saying here and apply them to our situation in our life today. So when we think about the thief, 
I want us to think about Satan. We have a true enemy that's alive, that walks about as a roaring lion, searching out whom he may devour. We have our flesh, something that we're tied to, that we'll only get rid of when Jesus comes back or we're given that heavenly body. And we have the world, the philosophies of the world and the movement of the world, the beliefs of the world. And we have those as true enemies. And their job is to steal, to kill, and to destroy whatever life they can. But then Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. We have the gospel. We have that Jesus has come to give life. And you and I, we must be telling others about Jesus. And so when we look at this passage of Scripture, it's just a, just a rough outline really for the message this morning, but I want us to draw out of it some problems that we see. And the first is that the thief has come to steal and kill and to destroy. And so that's a problem. Wouldn't you all agree? And so when we think about the world and the world that we are living in now, we have many problems, some would say. What's something right now that it's been in our faces for months? Something that we're dealing with, something that's changing our society, something with even how we go to the store, how we shop, how we talk to other people. What is it? The coronavirus, right? COVID-19, we have a new pandemic, something that I know my generation has not dealt with, maybe that my parents' generation has not dealt with. But it's something that's real, it's in our faces, and it's made a very strong impact on America and the world right now. And so, I'm going to give you some statistics about COVID. Now, I'm not preaching a message about the pandemic, but I want us to look at some of the things that we are faced with things that we are dealing with right now in our world. And right now, that's probably the most prominent thing that we can think about. But right now in the United States, these figures are a little old. I didn't update them, but they're a couple of weeks old. But there's, about, there's over 3 million total cases. There have been over 3 million total cases of COVID-19 in the United States. We've had right at 140,000 people die in the last few months because of the coronavirus. And we've, we've got at least 1.7 million, million active cases right now in the U.S. Now, that's, that's just statistics. That's just numbers. But there's something else about this pandemic that has gone outside of the healthcare realm. And it's impacted our society. It's impacted the way people act and the way people think. It's impacted us in several, many different ways. And when we think about What's going on? We've seen families lose jobs. We've seen loved ones not being able to provide the way they used to for their families. We see unemployment lines and people looking for work. We see businesses closing. Right now, uh, in a, a, it's, but Fun Depot over on Sweet and Creek Road is closing because they can't maintain their business right now. We've seen the stock market. Of course, it's rebounded back, but... But during that time in March and in April, but it went, right, and dropped like a rock. We've seen um, paper towels and toilet paper fly off the shelves to where when you walk into Walmart and you go down the paper aisle, what's even there? And what's up with that anyway? I don't understand. I would have never guessed that a respiratory illness would cause people to go out and take toilet paper off the shelves in droves. Blows my mind. Well, I would never expect that. But that's something that we've seen. Now, how many of you have dealt with the one-way aisles at Walmart? Right? Now, when you go into a store, you got to walk down an aisle a certain way. Okay? It took me a little while to get used to that. But I'd be heading down the wrong way, and I'd, I wouldn't pay attention to the floor, and I'm going down the wrong way, and everybody's facing me, and they're giving me dirty looks, right? Because <laughs> I'm heading down the wrong way. But I still cheat. I told everybody this morning I still cheat. Because the Walmart in Hendersonville... The tuna that we buy is right at the end of the aisle. And there's a do not enter sign. And all I do is I pull my buggy up. <laughs> hey, is it wrong if you pull your buggy up and then back in? <laughs> Get the tuna and leave. <laughs> Sometimes I really what I do, I just pull up and I'm just like, grab it, throw it in the cart and go. But these are major changes. Things that, I mean, who would have thought six months ago this is something that's going to happen in our country? 
But even beyond that, and no matter where you stand on this, I'm going to name some issues, but no matter where you stand, whether through this pandemic you're pro-mask, you're anti-mask, or somewhere in between, whether you believe that some, as some believe that this is an entire hoax and conspiracy, or you know someone that lives in true fear, and I'm, not, I'm just saying they truly are afraid, and they have quarantined themselves and they're not coming out of their home. Some people have said this is a political weapon. Some people have argued this is a government takeover. And I'm just naming some things that have come out of this. Some say it might be a biological attack on our country. But because of these issues and the things that are in our society, these things have caused outbursts, they've caused injury, they've caused fear, and they've caused division. Wouldn't you say there's division in our society? And some of these things have even affected the family of God. Now, I'll just tell you this, guys. None of these things that deal with this pandemic should divide us, okay? We are to stand in unity on the truths of God's Word. We are brothers and sisters in the same family of Christ. And we should be encouraging each other. We should be supporting each other. We should be helping each other and showing love to each other. And not fighting, not going out on social media and making rants and raves like some do. We shouldn't be doing that, okay? We've got each other's backs. Let's stand on the truth. The unity is, is not just based on the gospel. It's based on the truths of God's word. And we're supposed to stand together as a family. So let's strive to do that and to be uh, loving to each other and helpful. But that's a true, this is a true problem. Or that this has happened in our society. What else do we see in our society? When I think of Asheville, where our church is, we're right, right close to downtown. And inside the city limits of Asheville, there are 30 breweries. Just in the city limits. Now, I was at the Outer Banks with my, my wife's side of the family last, in June. And um, we had about 20 people from my wife's side. We were all staying in the house. So it was one of the best vacations that I've ever had. But one day, we decided to go down. We'd already planned it, really, to go to a seafood market and buy a ton of crab legs and shrimp. I mean, we dropped some major money on this. We ate almost every bit of it. Just one crab leg, crab leg cluster was left, and that was it. You should have seen Daniela. She got on the crab legs and was like... But I was standing in line to buy some of this stuff, and I started talking to the fellow that was there in line with me. <clears throat> he was from Ohio. And I told him I was from Asheville, North Carolina. And you know what he knew about Asheville? Beer. Right? That's what he knew about Asheville is beer. Now, in our country, I'm going to read some more statistics. I got some numbers here. But in our country in 2018, there were over 14 million adults, that's 18 and over, that as defined by the, the survey that I was looking at, that had a medically defined problem with alcohol. Now, I'm going to tell you this, Christian. Medically defined, that does no. If you're drinking any sort of wine, beer, strong drink, that's a problem, okay? That has no place in our lives, okay? We should not, as Christians and believers, be partaking of alcoholic beverages, all right? I'm just inserting that. But we know that as the world looks at it, they, that, that social drinking and things like that are accepted, so they have medically defined problems. Well, let's go a little further. In 2012, we know that 10% of U.S. children lived with a parent that had an alcohol problem. 10% of kids. Now, that may sound like a low percentage, but think of the number out of the millions of children that are in our country. In 2010, get this. This is 10 years old, but in 2010, between the ages of 20 to 39, 25% of all deaths worldwide, now think of that, 25%, all deaths worldwide for 20 to 39-year-olds, 25% attributable to alcohol. That's staggering. An estimated 88,000 people in the U.S. will die a year due to alcohol. In Buncombe County, in 2010, there were over 1,000 DUI arrests in a year. That's over 20 arrests a day. And that's just the ones that were arrested. 
That's how many people, just imagine how many people driving around on the roads under the influence of alcohol. We have uh, the opioid epidemic. We've not heard about that in a while. Things have kind of calmed down from that. But 128 people die a day in our country because of opioids, because of drug use. We had a young man that went through our Christian school, went through our youth group, graduated, and was gone into the world. He died, a, um, goodness, I, I think it was last month. I don't know if it's last month or month before, but he died from a heroin overdose. I think it was heroin. About 25 years old. Wasted, I mean, just life just gone. Just gone. A precious soul gone. Suicide. People that take their own lives. 44,000 Americans a year take their own lives. In the world, listen, in the world, between the ages of 15 to 24, our young people coming into adulthood, second leading overall cause of death in the world, taking their own lives. What's, what's wrong? You know, what's wrong? What's missing? In North Carolina in 2018, for every two marriages, there was one divorce. Our families are attacked. The devil, the world, the flesh goes after our families, our marriages, because that is the base of our society. That's what God made first. Made Adam and brought, him, brought to, to him Eve, and a family was formed. In the United States right now, in the United States, there's been over 22 million children die this year, and it's just near the end of July. 22 million children die due to abortion. And that's not to mention also all the protests and the civil unrest where people are hurt, angry, acting out. We've seen all kinds of things in our society. I was driving home a couple weeks ago from work, and I turned on uh, 570 AM, and Sean Hannity was on the radio. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a Sean Hannity fan, but I just turned it on, and I heard his show. And there was a caller that called in, and he said, he said, you know, he said, people in our society, in our country, are acting out in rage and despair, despair. But listen to what he said. He said, and that the government needed to find the root cause. Now, the government doesn't, they're not going to find the root cause, okay? But he is right. There is a root cause. And the people of this world are walking around in despair. They're walking around in hopelessness. They're walking around in fear, in loneliness, wondering what purpose is. Our, our public schools teach evolution and that you're an accident. What purpose does an accident have? No wonder our young people are taking their own lives in the world. They have no direction. They don't know where they come from. That they're created by God with a purpose. But you know what? It's not a pandemic that's a problem. I said at first they're problems. It's, just, they're not, it's not a problem. It's not illness or disease that's a problem. It's not racism that's a problem. It's not drugs and alcohol that's a problem. These things are the symptoms. They're bad, but they're the symptoms of one root cause. And you know what that root cause is? It's sin. Okay? We are all born into this world separated from our Creator. We have a sin nature. And because of our sin nature and we're sinners, that's why we sin. And we look to ourselves instead of looking to God and a lot of people don't know. There's no amount of reform. There's no amount of legislation. There is no number of laws or social organizations or, or um, investment in our community that's going to solve the problem. Those things may be band-aids for the symptoms, but sin is the problem. And what's the answer to sin? Jesus Christ. Right? Right? Jesus Christ. So people walk in this world, not only are they lost and they're wandering, not only has the thief stolen their lives, not only are they dying in sin, not only are they hurt and hopeless and in despair, but they're also heading to an eternity in hell and the lake of fire. But the answer is the truth. The answer is Jesus Christ. 
And so we see the problem of the world, the same problem that we had, the same problem that Jesus fixed in our lives to save us from our sin, that paid for our sin, and knowing Him as our Savior, we can live in victory and abundance of life over our sin, living through the challenges, living through the storms because we have the truth of Jesus Christ. And so the problem of the world is sin, but there's a second problem I see in this verse. Because Jesus said, I am come. Jesus has come. He left heaven. Now imagine, he left heaven to come here as a man and walked on this earth to be crucified, a horrible death for his blood to be poured out intentionally to pay for your sins and mine. And then on the third day, let's not forget, he rose from the dead. Thousands of people were crucified, but only one rose from the dead. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the perfect sacrifice shown through God's power that he rose from the dead, that he paid the price, the only one that could do it. And he's the truth and the answer. And we have that. But the problem is, is, and the problem is, is the truth's not getting out there. When we think about the truth, in John chapter 18, Pilate asked Jesus that question. He says, what's the truth? I'll read you the scripture. Pilate says, talking to Jesus, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And Pilate said this, What is the truth? And and when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. You guys remember Ed McMiniman, right? He was here for a year. I don't know how, how long, but Ed has a sister named Amanda, okay? Now, this is one of those, your father's brother, sister, cousin. So, has a sister, Amanda, and Amanda and her husband, Nick Hefner, were the ministers of, he was the minister of music at Temple for years. Now they, they are in Pennsylvania. But one day, Nick and I were out knocking on doors. And we knocked on this one fellow's door, and, and he came out, and we started talking to him. And you know what he said? He said, what is truth? And he said, there is no truth. But Nick had a great answer for him. He said, well, for that to be a true statement, then there has to be truth. Right? Because if he's saying there's no truth, well, if that's true, that's a truth, so there must be truth. And and otherwise, it's a false statement. I like how the word game won't play that truth is relative because it's not. There is truth. And Jesus said in John chapter 14, he said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 15, the Bible says, Jesus said, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, he shall testify of me. We know that Jesus is the truth. We know that the Holy Spirit is the truth. And in John 17, 17, Jesus praying in the garden, praying to the Heavenly Father, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. My friends, we have the truth. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. When we have asked Jesus into our hearts, when we accepted Jesus Christ through faith, the Holy Spirit moved inside of you and dwells within you. And the Spirit moved in and quickened your spirit and brought your spirit alive so you could have that connection and that relationship with God because God wants a relationship with each individual on this earth. And we have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, living inside of us. We know Jesus as our Savior. We hold God's truth in our hands. But where is it missing? What's the problem? We don't have the truth on our lips as often as we should. You and I are witnesses. What's a witness? If you've trusted Jesus Christ, you're a witness. Now, a witness is somebody who has knowledge, personal experience of a change or an event. 
And when you trusted Jesus Christ, whatever brought you to the cross, whatever the Holy Spirit used in your life to convict you of your need of a Savior, and you came to that place where you cried out, you prayed, whatever it was, when you, when you asked Jesus, put your faith and belief in Christ as your Savior, something changed. The Bible says we're new creatures. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you witnessed that. You have a personal, unique, individual testimony that's real, that's genuine, that God wants you to share with other people. And I'm right there with you. When we think about telling others about Jesus, we don't need to have, I mean, we don't need to have a Ph.D., okay? We don't need to have a college degree. We don't need a high school diploma. We don't need extensive training. All we have to do is tell others what Jesus did for us. Share scripture that we know, sure. Give God's word and tell how it's changed our lives. Because that's what people need. They need something real. I mean, how many of you trust the news today? Right? When I listen to the, I read the news, I'm like, I don't know what to believe. People don't know what to believe. I mean, they're tossed and turned. What's the truth? There is no truth. But something real and genuine? You and me, witnesses for Jesus Christ? That's, that's what people want. That's what people need. And so you and I must be testimonies. We must be witnesses and telling others. But the problem is, is we're not doing it as we should. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, he said, But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost. Whenever uh, um, last fall, last year, um, we decided at our church, we, we did something called the fall campaign. And our goal was in three months to hand out 5,000 door hangers, okay? Just door hangers that invited people to our church and had a gospel tract on the other side. And all we were doing is putting them on doors, right? That was our goal. And in doing that, um, our pastor called one of the local churches. I don't know which one, but one of the churches is just over around Asheville. And he wanted to make sure that we weren't going to, so to speak, invade their territory. You know, they may have a target neighborhood or something like that. We didn't want to step on their toes. So he's just asking, hey, look, this is what we're doing. We're putting the gospel out. We're inviting people to our church. We just want to make sure we don't come into any place where you guys might be going out and and soul winning or anything like that. And you know what their pastor said? We don't do that. We don't do that. When I was an ambassador, when I started way back in 2006, which really doesn't seem that long ago, even though it's 14 years ago, I read a book, it's called The Vanishing Ministry. And in that book, the, the author's putting forth that there are more churches in our country, local churches, closing their doors than there are churches that are being born and being ministries for, for Jesus Christ. And so I think that, you know, you can do the research and you can look things up, but I think that's probably a truth. That the impression I have is that the churches are dying. I'm going to read a passage from Revelation. You don't, you don't have to turn there, you can if you like. But Revelation chapter 2, and I want us to read um, the first five verses. Revelation chapter 2. And this is Christ. He's dictating to John as John's uh, exiled on the Isle of Patmos. What he wants John to write to the church at Ephesus. He says, unto the angel, Jesus says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works. And thy labor and thy patience. So Jesus is saying, I know what you guys are doing. He says, And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. So they know truth. He says, And hast borne and hast patience. And for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Now, this sounds like a church that knows what they're doing. Sounds like a church that has good ministries. A church that knows the truth. Okay? A good church. 
But then in verse 4 he says this, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. He says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. Now what is that? Now some people may debate what that means. But let me just submit to you this, that that church was a good church with good ministries. And they were helping each other, but there was something that was missing. He says, to remember from whence thou art fallen. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul tells us to not forget that we came out of the world. When we trusted Jesus and was born into God's family, we came out of the world. We're not to forget that. He says to remember that. And we are to remember where we came from and go back to the first work, which I would argue is making disciples. And the first step of making a disciple is what? They have to trust Jesus. You can tell people the Bible truths all day long and it doesn't matter unless they know Jesus and they're part of God's family. So that first work, that first love is telling others. Telling others about Christ, sharing the gospel. And that's what you and I need to be doing. And I think and I believe that that's being lost all throughout the country with our churches. And so what we need to do, we see the problem with the world. And we see the problem with the witness that the gospel is not going forth as it should. But there's a third part that I want to talk about. And that's the warrior. See, I've alliterated. World, witness, warrior. Okay? We're starting a program over at Temple. Uh, it's called One a Day Warrior. And I'm just using this as an example. I'm just, I'm just talking. And we think about a warrior, but we think about a warrior with compassion. And I want to explain that to you. In Jude, verse 22, the Bible says this, And if some have compassion, making a difference. You know, when we look out and we know that Jesus said, I have come that they might have life. Well, that's eternal life. But then he says, and that they might have it more abundantly. That means that they would have the best life. An extraordinary life. You and I should have the best life a human being can have on earth with Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? It means we have the truth. We have the Holy Spirit. We know that God strengthens us. We can have peace. Even though trials come, Jesus said we'd be persecuted. Jesus said there'd be trials. There's storms in life. There's challenges. Everybody in this auditorium has had something in their life that they've had to deal with. We're all unique. And I don't know those stories, but God does. And God says that when we know the truth... We can have that assurance and we can have that peace and that strength through times of need. But people without Christ, they don't have that. And that's why they turn to alcohol. That's why they take their own lives. That's why they turn to drugs. That's why there's so many things that are wrong. And they're hurting. And their destination from this earth is hell and the lake of fire. What a, what a, and when I say this, not, it's not, what a miserable existence to not have Jesus. And so we're to have compassion. And when I think of a warrior, I don't think of being militant. Okay? We can't go up and grab somebody by the shirt and say, Hey, you listen to me, buddy. You're a sinner going to hell. You better trust Jesus. You think that person's going to respond in the right way? <laughs> I wouldn't. We can't be that way. It's not our job to force the gospel down people's throat. It's not our job to get people saved. Whose job is that? The Holy Spirit's. Our job is to sow the seed. The Bible talks about soul winners as sowers of seed, as fishers of men, as laborers in the harvest, right? And that's what you and I are to be. And we tell others. We sow that seed and we tell others about Jesus. We tell, tell them what he's done for us. And we let the Holy Spirit do the work of conviction and the saving work. But that's what we do. We tell others. We sow that seed. But as a warrior, when I think about telling others about Jesus... Now, you may have different reasons. I can only speak for myself. But whenever I go out door knocking, I'm scared to death. I'm literally, I'm scared to death. I don't know who's going to answer the door. I don't know what they're going to say. Now, we're not, we're not doing door knocking now because of COVID-19. 
But seriously, I'm always like, man, are they going to be home? <laughs> but that's me. I deal with fear. But the Bible tells us in Jeremiah, what's the most frightening thing on somebody? It's their face, right? When you're talking to somebody and they look at you funny or they look at you like, oh, no. But God told Jeremiah when he was called to preach to Israel, he said, don't fear their faces. Don't be afraid of their faces. We have to remember that when we're standing there talking to somebody else, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about that person's need, that person's soul, and their need for Jesus Christ. And if somebody rejects you and me, if they say something ugly, if they're mean, if they kick us off their front porch, if they're like, don't talk to me, I don't need that, they're not rejecting you and me. They're rejecting God. That's who they're really rejecting. So we need to keep that in mind. And in 2 Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. See, we can go out knowing that we have the power of the Holy Spirit when we're talking to others about Jesus. In Acts, Jesus told the, uh, the, well, the apostles were told they were given power to go out and to tell the world about, the, about Jesus Christ, to tell the world the gospel. And so we have God's power. We also have a sound mind, knowing that we can have peace, knowing that we're doing what God wants us to do, and that it's not up to us to be successful. We don't have to put pressure on ourselves or, or beat ourselves up if someone doesn't trust Christ, because that's not our part, as we've already said. We can have a sound mind and peace knowing what we're doing is right, and God does the work. We sow the seed. And then finally, love. Have a spirit of love. Loving that other person. You know, the Bible says that, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet loses his own what? Soul. One soul is worth more than all the fame, all the glory, all the prestige, all the riches, all the possessions, anything and everything that the world has to offer, accumulated all in a one big pile, one soul is more valuable than all of that. And there's over 7.8 billion souls on this earth right now. And no telling how many have walked before us. If one person, only one person had inhabited the earth, Jesus would have come and died for them. That's how precious a soul is to our Creator. And so we need to think of that love and compassion for them. Now, it's a, it's a funny story. I, think, I, I want to tell this story. I kind of missed the part that I needed to tell it when I was talking about being militant. <laughs> but let me tell it anyway. Just forgive me. Dr. Scoville, and Josh knows Dr. Scoville. He's the, he's the, he was the head of music when I was at Ambassador um, Baptist College. And Dr. Scoville's not much bigger than me, but he is tough as nails. Okay, He's a fellow you wouldn't want to tangle with. All right. Even though I don't know how old he is now, he would take most if everybody in this auditorium at one time. And so Dr. Scoville decided one day that he needed to go to Sears to buy a microwave. This was years and years ago. And the microwaves are on the back wall inside the, <clears throat> the store. So he walked down the aisle and got to the back wall of the microwaves, started looking at the microwaves, and two men walked up to him and they threatened him and they wanted him to give them money. And you know what he did? Reached in his pocket, he pulled out a tract, and he said, Here, read this before I tear your arms off and throw them in the microwave. I think that's a good story. Of course, that really doesn't apply, but it's kind of like, <laughs> we just can't be that way. You know, like, here. But I think in his situation, it was appropriate. <laughs> but we need to have compassion. But the other thing that we deal with is, is apathy. Now, I'm not, I'm not being mean when I say that. I, I know we care, Okay. But sometimes I think that we care more about other things, like you're in a rush, you're in a hurry, you don't have time for this or that. And, and I understand, all, believe me, I'm, when I'm saying this, I'm talking to myself, okay? Um, but in Mark chapter 2, in Mark chapter 2, there was a, a man that was lame. He was paralyzed, and he lived on a bed. He couldn't take care of himself and depended on others to take care of him. And Jesus came to that town, it was Capernaum. And Jesus came to Capernaum, and the Bible tells us that he went into a certain house, and the crowds, it was noised about that Jesus was there, and the crowds piled in at the house. They wanted to get to Jesus. 
And this man that was lame had four friends. And these four friends knew that Jesus was there. And that Jesus could heal their friend. And so you know what they did? They went and they got their friend. Four of them picked up his bed and carried him to Jesus. Now it didn't stop when they got to the door because the Bible says the crowd was so heavy and thick. They couldn't get to him. They couldn't move through the crowd with that bed and get to Jesus. So what did they do? Those four men carried their friend to the roof of the house. Whose ever house it was, I don't know. And the Bible says that they started to break up the roof. To break it up. Now, I don't know what tools they had. I don't know if they used their hands, if they had axes, picks, whatever. Jackhammers, I don't know. But the thing is, is the idea is that they worked. They had an obstacle, a challenge. The crowd was there. They couldn't get to Jesus. Their friend had a need. They wanted to get him to Jesus because they knew that Jesus could heal him. And so they didn't let any challenge or obstacle get in their way. They went on the roof. And broke up that poor man's roof. Can you imagine the homeowner's insurance claim on that? Yeah, some four guys came and broke my roof up. But they didn't let that stop them. And then they had to make a hole big enough to lower him down flat. Right? So they had to make a big hole and then lower that man down to Jesus. And Jesus healed him. And it's because they cared. You see, they knew the need. And they saw the answer. And they said, you know what? This is our chance. Let's not miss this chance. Let's get our buddy to Jesus. And that's the way we need to look at other people that are lost. When God gives us somebody, we should pray and ask the Lord to bring somebody to us. Can we cross a path for somebody today? Is there a way, somebody we can talk to? Lord, help me with that. And when that divine appointment is met and somebody comes to us, let's think, you know what, this is our chance. Let's sow the seed. And let's care for that person as a soul. Someone that's bound for eternity, living in a life of despair. Bound for eternity in the lake of fire and bound and living in despair. So let's not let apathy get in our ways. Now you may have other points too, other things that you deal with. But when I think of a warrior, I think of meeting those challenges as a warrior. That's why I'm saying let's be warriors. Let's overcome those challenges. Let's overcome fear with courage. You know, John Wayne, courage is, is not the absence of fear. Right? John Wayne said that, that courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. That's a good quote. And that's the way we need to be. To have that courage and that warrior spirit that we're going to overcome those obstacles and those challenges and do what the Lord wants us to do because it's important, it's God's will, and we care for others. So we see that the world has a problem, and it's sin. Separated from the Creator. We see despair and hopelessness because of that. We see another problem with our witness that maybe, you know, for some, I, some of you may be diligent at, at soul winning, I don't know, but we know that we're not getting the gospel out like we should. But then finally is that warrior spirit, being a warrior for the Lord, being compassionate and sowing the seed in love, but overcoming whatever obstacle we may have to tell others about Jesus. Lord, I thank